Haters, and we've got Morgan Housel in the house. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Howdy, folks. Matt Kopenheffer here, joined by David Hansen and Morgan Housel, Fool.com contributor. Guys, let's start off with the headlines. The first headline we've got here is from Bloomberg. It says the Fed finds 18 large banks weak in at least one capital area. David, just a few months ago, the banks passed the Fed's stress tests. Was that all just a big lie? Yeah, you said 18 banks have weakness. There were 18 banks that were part of the stress test scenarios just back in March. So when I saw this, I was kind of like, well, most of them passed back in March. 14 of them got their CCAR, so their capital distributions, those, all those plans were approved. The four that did not get those approved right away were JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, BB&T, and Ally Financial. Everyone else, they passed with flying colors. So I was kind of confused by this. But their biggest concern was the bank's internal calculations of what happens dur uh, during market stress time. So the, the Fed went in and said, if this happens in the market, unemployment skyrockets, stock market falls off, this is what happens to your books. Now you tell us what happens to your books. And there were some big discrepancies there between what the Fed thought would happen and what the banks thought would happen. The one bank I'll note that wasn't far off from the Fed was Citigroup, a bank that we've talked about is a little bit surprising, their capital ratios uh, recently. Capital's very high. They appear to be agreeing with the Fed on some scenarios, so. Agreeing it, with the Fed, that's very you know, rare that too some, often. Very rare with some of the banks. Again, I think this is a little bit just noise, just a, a report from the Fed. I don't think this is a huge deal for the banks. We'll get these stress tests again in March. If there's still concerns then, Maybe that's room for concern, but not right now. Morgan, concerned about bank capital levels? Well, look, these, the history of these stress tests is, is pretty poor. You know, one of my favorite examples is about a year before Cyprus had its meltdown earlier this year. The country and all of its banks were passing stress, were passing stress tests le left and right. It's really hard for regulators to find the balance between trying to be tough on these banks when they're stress testing them and not scaring the market by making it so tough and coming out and saying, look, all these banks might be in serious trouble. That could cause panic and, and really scare investors. It's a hard balance to find. I think the history shows pretty clear that, that regulators choose to stay on the cautious side of, of, of going after these banks with stress tests, on stress tests with a, a, a feathered hand. Being I, easy with them. I, I'm, I, for one, I'm happy to see headlines like this. Capital levels at banks are very, very high. If, if these kind of headlines are going to scare bank investors, make bank stocks a little bit cheaper, all the better for me. I'll be out there buying. Moving to the FT, we've got a headline, Don't Put Faith in Cape Crusaders. This is Jeremy Siegel taking on Robert Schiller and the Cyclically Adjusted Price Earnings Index. Morgan, why is this important and is Siegel right? Yeah, so CAPE uh, is, is a valuation metric that many value investors follow. There's the typical PE ratio, which just looks at one year's earnings. Mm -hmm. CAPE takes the last 10 years earnings, averages together, adjusts for inflation. It's sort of a broader measure that, that is cyclically adjusted, as the name implies. What Siegel is, 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 has looked at, he's been saying for years, is that CAPE has many flaws in it that makes it look like the market is overvalued when at times it's often not. One of the, one of the uh, really interesting stats that Jeremy Siegel pointed out in his piece in the Financial Times is that in the last 21 years, CAPE has been overvalued in all but nine months. So you should uh, never have been buying stocks over the last 20 years. Buying stocks for the last 20 years. So when you, years. when you say overvalued, that means it was just above what the historical average was. Above there. its long-term average. So CAPE, which is put together by uh, Robert Schiller of Yale, goes back to 1871. It's a huge set of data. I think one of the problems, and Siegel points this out too, is that the historical data we have from the 1800s and really before the 1950s is questionable at best, especially with earnings. The measure of earnings that we have before about 1950 uh, is I think at best you could call it uh, a decent guess. Mm -hmm. So you know it, it's really it's really kind of sketchy when we're comparing earnings from uh, 1890 to today and assuming it's apples to apples. I think it's very clear that it's not. And the fact that Cape has been again overvalued 95% uh, of the time for the past 21 years shows that that average might be more skewed than we think. Mm -hmm. David, are you a fan of the Cape? And what were your best buys in 1890? <laughs> it was not not quite alive, almost. Uh, Am I a fan of it? I'm kind of I'm kind of a whatever. Last week we saw the FT I think put out an article saying that the Cape was the right measure to look at. Now we're seeing this one that's saying, oh, maybe it's not the best. I think it just goes to show you, you can't look at one metric and say, oh, well, this says the stock market's overvalued. I'm not going to be buying for, for a while now. Or, or saying, oh, it's undervalued. I need to rush out and buy. I think you look at these things as kind of a nice to have. But uh, I mean, I, I'm a bottoms up investor. I'm going to be looking at the companies. Do the companies look undervalued that I'm interested in? Do they look overvalued? 
you can have an opinion on the market. I don't think it should drive necessarily whether you should pull all your money out of the market because the cape is a little bit higher than normal. You can look at it. I wouldn't be basing tons of investment uh, decisions off of it. I, you know, I, I, I agree with you, David. I don't, I don't think there's any one metric that investors should be basing it on. However, CAPE at the extremes has been really effective. If you were looking back to 1929, if you were looking at 2000, uh, if you were looking at the 19, early 1980s, these were great times to be buying or selling, and, uh, and, the, and the CAPE showed that. Moving back over to Bloomberg, we have a headline, Bubbles Bloom Anew in Desert Area as Buyers Wager on Las Vegas. Morgan Carl Case in this article said that Phoenix and Las Vegas, he said of Phoenix and Las Vegas, they're clearly in bubbles. I'm, I'm not going to argue with Carl Case. He's clearly. a smart guy. He understands real estate better than I do. He's a namesake behind the Case-Shiller housing index. One thing I would point out, though, is that when we're talking about bubbles, uh, so sure, you can look at Vegas and, and whatnot and say, look, home prices are going up 10, 20 percent per year, sometimes more than that. But that's a very different kind of bubble than we had last decade. Last decade was a but were, was price gains driven by demand, by optimism among homeowners that home prices go up, 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 and we should keep buying and buy a second and a third house. Home prices are surging today across the country, but especially places like Las Vegas, because of very low supply. Now, that's a totally different mm -hmm. dynamic than, in, than buyers rushing in. We have very low supply, uh, mostly because home builders uh, have, have, have been pushed out of the market over the past five years during the housing bust, but also they are leery to start building again in huge amounts because, of course, they want prices to go up. They want pricing power. So home builders across the country, you can see these in their conference calls, are holding supply back from the market intentionally. So right now, the, the supply of for sale homes in the United States is pretty close to the lowest it's been in decades. So that's going to push home prices up. Uh, but it's a very different kind of bubble than we saw last decade. Now, David, you are a shareholder in Zillow, which has been an animal of a stock over the past year. Thinking about the gains in, in the housing market, would you rather be in services companies like Zillow, real estate services companies, Remax is thinking about coming to the market with an IPO, or would you rather be in the home builder stocks thinking about, uh, about a rebound in, in activity there? Well, since I'm, I am an investor in Zillow, I'm not going to say I wouldn't be interested in that. Given where Zillow stock is now compared to where I bought it, it's a little bit pricey right now. I would be jumping in. A little bit. I think it's at like 20 okay. times a lot, revenue. A lot of bit pricey <laughs> right now. The home builders are certainly interesting. When we talk about these housing bubbles, uh, last time Morgan was on the show, we talked about recency bias, saying, oh, the last bubble, the next bubble is going to be just like it. And like you said, if we look at this from the bank's perspective, some bank investors might be nervous and saying, oh, another housing bubble, this is going to be terrible for the banks. I don't look at it that way. Yes, prices are going up, like Morgan said, because of supply and demand. This isn't because of shoddy underwriting, giving loans to people that shouldn't have them. Those were the things that got us into trouble beforehand and, and in addition to the demand. So from the bank's perspective, a bank investor's perspective, I wouldn't be nervous about these bubbles out, out west there. Great. Well, that wraps it up for the headlines with Morgan here in the house, one of our uh, macroeconomic experts here at The Fool. We'll go on to our next segment, Macrovision. <laughs> uh, Morgan, uh, continuing unemployment claims have been dropping pretty precipitously lately. What is going on and what can investors take away from, from that change? Yeah, so some numbers that really surprised me uh, recently when I looked at them. For the past 30 years, the average number of Americans receiving unemployment benefits has been 2.9 million. What do you guys think they are today? If the 30-year average is 2.9 million, we know unemployment is still high. What do you think those numbers are today? I'm going to go with about 3 million. 3 million? Okay. David? You said 2.9 is the average. Right. I'll go 4 million. I'll go 4 million. It's, it's 2.9. It's actually, a, it's actually a tad below average right now. So we have well above average unemployment, but below average uh, number of Americans on unemployment benefits. And when you adjust for population, it's significantly below. So it's a really interesting dynamic that we have right now of many people unemployed, but a shrinking percentage of those people who are unemployed are receiving any benefits. So there are a couple of takeaways from that. One is that the argument that so many Americans are not working uh, is because they are just, just milking unemployment benefits and laying on the couch watching TV can easily be shot down when you see how few of them, especially the long-term unemployed, are actually receiving uh, benefits at all. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of long-term unemployed, people have been unemployed for six months or one year or longer, don't receive any benefits right now. 
And I think the big takeaway from that is that the scars left over from the Great Recession that we have will very likely last for decades. When you have such a huge portion of the, the, the workforce that has been left out of the workforce for five years is receiving no unemployment benefits, that's extremely difficult to recover from ever. There have been mm -hmm. a lot of studies that, that show this, that decades down the line you can still measure the impact of long-term unemployed people like this. So how that affects banks that we're talking about, the single most variable, the single most important variable for judging bank defaults is unemployment and income. It's whether people have jobs. That makes sense. Whether you have a job and income, you, you, you can pay your car loan, pay your credit card that, bill. That makes a fair amount of sense. <laughs> right. Pretty straightforward. Uh, but no, we have, like I was saying, this big portion of the population that has been left out and receiving no unemployment benefits. That's a portion of the population that's going to have such a hard time recovering. And I think for banks to see a significant decline in defaults going forward, they, they've already seen a, a They've already a, seen a, 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 a there's various, been a big drop already. A very sizable uh, sh shrinkage in defaults, credit card loans, auto loans, and whatnot. To see more improvement, you're going to need significantly lower unemployment or much higher income. And when I look at the numbers, of unemployed that are completely left out, it, it makes me wonder how much more improvement we're going to have uh, in so, labor markets going forward. But what's forward. the solution? And, and, well, I, I, th I think for millions of Americans, this, the solution is, is pretty dire. I mean, there, there, there's no silver bullet that we can say, this is how we fix it, this is how we get back to 1999 prosperity. I think it's, it's, it's difficult. And I, I'm glad I'm not a politician that has to make solutions because I don't think there are any easy that solutions. That is not the optimistic view that I was hoping from you, Morgan. David, what's your solution? Uh, I don't know about the solution. <laughs> my, my, I guess my, my question to Morgan would be, doesn't sound great. For, for those average Americans that don't have jobs, that are unemployed or long time un unemployed, what does it mean for big multinationals here in the U.S. that have a lot of international operations that they're relying less on the U.S. consumer to drive revenue? Does that mean it's not that big of a deal for, for companies and stocks? They'll continue to perform because they have the ability to go internationally, get revenue there to make up for maybe lagging revenue here in the U.S. Well, I think there's some truth to that, but the one rebuttal is that just because a company has international exposure doesn't necessarily mean that it's better than the United States. Mm -hmm. So sure, that you know, you have companies, Procter & Gamble and Johnson Johnson, that do a lot of business in China and Europe. All those economies are doing, are doing poorly themselves, too. You have Europe, which is in a really bad situation, especially in the, the southern countries. China uh, is, is slowing down. Growth in Brazil is slowing down. Japan is, is still a mess. They're doing slightly better, but they've been a mess for 20 years. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say just because uh, big multinational companies have international exposure, that in itself is not a silver bullet either. That, that can drag down revenue mm -hmm. in the short run as well. Except to the extent that, that they're gaining market share, right? So, so if, the, if those economies aren't growing, but uh, somebody enters a new market and gains market share, that's... That's a way to grow. That's a part of it, yeah. And you know that's really true for uh, for earning. When, when you look at the past twenty years, the share of of profits in the S and P five hundred that have come from overseas has really has really increased from about ten percent to more than thirty percent over the last twenty years. So now that Morgan has sufficiently depressed us, let's <laughs> move on to our new game called Fool in the Blank. In each one of these, I'm going to read a sentence with a blank in it, and I'm going to ask one of the other of you guys, to fool in the blank. So Morgan, we'll start with you, and I'll go with blank should be the biggest concern for stock investors right now. Morgan, fool in the blank. It's their own emotions, and that's not just true right now, that's always. What really hurts investor returns over time uh, is not recessions, it's not bad policies, it's not oil shocks, it's their own decisions that they make with their money about selling right after crashes and buying at the top. Those are the decisions that hurt investors all the time, and that's what they should always be focusing on, is focusing on less about what's going on in the economy, less about what other investors are, are talking about, what's the, ne the next big sector. They should be focusing on their own, um, their own emotions to make sure they're not doing anything too foolish with their money. Great. Number two, David, M. REIT, mortgage REIT investors should blank. David, I fill got, in that blank. I got two words to fill in the blank. I hope that's not uh, cheating. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you go. M. REIT investors should be picky and have a, a strong stomach. Oh, that, that, that is a long, that's, that's, that's a, a long that's phrase a big, to fit a, in there's that a, blank. It's a big blank there. So picky, it's easy to look at the mortgage REITs and say, Look at those dividends. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. I can't believe I found this opportunity. But you have to be aware about what's the business behind that dividend. Be very picky in terms of who's the management team, 
that is running the fund, running your money, essentially? Where are they allocating their money? What does it mean for the long term? What are their views on the environment right now? So that's, you have to be picky with what you're looking at. You can't just say, oh, American Capital Agency has a higher dividend than Annaly Capital. It's better, it's a better opportunity right now. That's a better buy. I think you really have to look, say, who's the management team? What's their philosophy? How are they allocating the portfolio right now? And in terms of having an iron stomach, it's been a volatile ride for mortgage rate investors. Over the last six months, a lot of those dividends have been completely wiped out from a stock price perspective. So you've gotten your dividends over the year, but your, your capital appreciation or capital depreciation in this instance has just wiped those out. I think that could continue. I think the mortgage rates are going to continue to be volatile. You're going to continue to see that until the interest rates normalize, if interest rates ever normalize. I'm sure Morgan has some thoughts on that. Uh, but yeah, be picky, have an iron stomach, know what you're buying, and be aware of what's underneath that. You, you own Annaly Capital. If there was a number two that you'd be buying past Annaly Capital, who would that be? That's a tough one. I may, have to, I may have to steal your choice, Two Harbors. They're a little bit more diversified. They're different than Annaly. Annaly focuses on that agency mortgage-backed security there. Two Harbors, a little bit more diversified. They do invest in agency mortgage-backed securities, but also have non-agency and some other real estate investments. They do have a, a pretty strong track record of diversifying there. So that one, that one I may be interested in. Not saying I'm buying it, but could be my second on the list. And I will field number three here. Number three is the legal news around JP Morgan is blank. I will not cheat like David. I will use one word, and that one word is overblown. The legal news around JP Morgan is overblown. I think part of the, con part, part of the reason that I, that I think some people have gotten concerned is that the, the legal section of JP Morgan's most recent quarterly report is very, very long. And so if you, if you scroll down to that and, and you just want to make a good headline or make a, a strong point in, in, a, in a media article, you can say, J.P. Morgan's legal section is X number of pages. J.P. Morgan's legal section is X number of words. And if you look at comp other, other banks, they're not quite as long. Part of it is, is that J.P. Morgan has provided a lot more detail on each of the legal proceedings that, that, than the other banks. And so that, that has an impact on the number. Uh, another part of that is that J.P. Morgan had those crisis era acquisitions, the Bear Stearns and, and the WAMU. Those are two, uh, I would say, areas of, of litigation currently for them. There are the crisis era lit litigations that J.P. Morgan is dealing with that are basically similar to all of the other banks. And that, that is Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citigroup, the, the other big banks. But it's also the smaller banks. It's also U.S. Bank Corp. It's also, it, it's going to be increasingly those banks because the regulators are now turning their focus to them. They're kind of, they've been working down this list, working through their backlog. And the, the big banks were the first ones that they were going to hit. Now they're moving on to some of the smaller banks. So the, the crisis era litigation, that's very similar. There is LIBOR-related litigation, which again, major banks all over the world. So JP Morgan, it's not like they're alone in that. And then there's the London Whale-related litigation. Uh, we can go into a lot of detail. We'll just leave it at that. It's basically a law firm with a little bank. In the <laughs> yeah. Side, right? And then finally, there are the... Uh, what I'm calling the disaster elsewhere related litigation. JP Morgan is a bank that has its hand in a lot of different pots and when something goes wrong elsewhere, they found themselves a, a target of, of litigation in the aftermath. Uh, Bernard Madoff, MF Global, Lehman Brothers, Enron, suits related to all of these things show up in JP Morgan's uh, legal section. So, put all of this together, am I concerned? Yes, I'm a little bit concerned as a J.P. Morgan shareholder myself, but I'm more concerned about what happens going forward, what we see three years from now as they, as they and the other banks try to sort of clean up their act and avoid doing this again. I would be much more concerned if J.P. Morgan's stock was trading at two, two and a half times tangible book value. Right now it's trading at 1.4 times tangible book value, delivering double-digit returns on equity. So that valuation right there, makes me a lot less concerned. It reduces the risk around the stock. And you talk about going through the report and anchoring on a headline saying, oh, it's this many pages. The numbers that a lot of people were anchoring on in their latest 10Q was legal expenses in excess of reserves could be between zero and 6.8 billion. So obviously everyone's gonna go to the 6.8 billion and say, look, they're, they have to spend 6.8 billion in extra legal costs. Mm -hmm. What well, also could be zero. They said between zero and 6.8 billion. So don't, fixate on that one number and say, oh, 6.8 billion, that's gone from shareholders' equity. That's an estimation. 
Maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's far under that. Like you said, overblown. My my net worth is between zero and six point. Yeah, <laughs> so you're right in there too. <laughs> Now we are going to finish off, as always, on the Twitters, and we'll start off with Bank of America. Uh, this is from at B of A underscore news, and the tweet was, B of A surpasses one million small business mobile users. David, what, what is the, why all the excitement over mobile banking? For the banks, it's good for them. It's a much cheaper way of servicing their customers than these small business clients coming into a banking a ban <laughs> bank. Use your words. There we go. Get it out. Uh, it's cheaper for the banks. It's obviously to have that just mobile app. They don't have to have someone servicing that in person, over the phone, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it's a good thing for banks and bank investors. It helps the bottom line there. And it's a convenience thing. And the more businesses that get on that mobile device, more consumers that get on the device, people aren't going to be as eager to switch. I mean, why would you switch if it's so easy just to get on your phone there? So I think it's a good thing for, for the banks, good thing for customers. Not many things you can, you can say that about the banks where it's a win-win for the customers and the banks. You don't hear that very often, but I think mobile banking is one of those. The next tweet we have is from at Ritholtz. This is Barry Ritholtz. The tweet is, shares trade in less correlation than at any time since the financial crisis. Morgan, first, what does this mean? Second, does this mean that you will be a stock picker now? Right, so uh, so when, when people are panicking like during the financial crisis 2008, 2009, they're, they're not going through their portfolio and doing deep analysis on every company. They're basically just saying sell everything or buy everything. It's this risk on, risk off trade that people have. Uh, that's, that's diminishing pretty significantly. And now, as, as Barry said, the correlation between individual stocks uh, is really getting low. So you have good stocks that are reporting good earnings, doing well, poor stocks, poor earnings, poor management, doing poorly, which is how it should work. That's how markets should work. Uh, so that, that's great if, if you're a stock picker. Uh, it's great for, for mutual fund managers that have had really poor performance over the past five, ten years when we've had high correlation where it's very difficult to be a good, to be a good stock picker. Will I become more of a stock picker? I, I still am a little bit of a stock picker. I, I buy a lot of index funds. Uh, so I'm, I'm just I'm more opportunistic with my stock picking than most. I think I'd, your, I'd, your number one stock pick right now. Well, I've been buying shares of Markel for the past few months. Um, I, I, I still like it because it's gotten a little bit cheaper over time. So that that's that's the one stock that I've been focusing on for the last. It's three getting months. cheaper and more awesome at the same time. As as the days <laughs> go by. Yep. Finishing off here, uh, we've got a tweet from Elon Musk. That's at Elon Musk. He tweets, Model S achieves best safety rating of any car ever tested by the U.S. government. This is, of course, referring to Tesla and its, and its inaugural car. David, does the banking sector need an Elon Musk to come in, change everything up, and, uh, and, and, and bring some light to, to the banking world? I think Morgan has a different opinion, but I'm going to say, yeah, I, I think so. Not total revamp. Of, of the banking world. I don't think everything needs to be changed, but there are a lot of things that could be changed, not just in the way that customers interact with the bank, but inside a bank and a bank culture. It's so stuffy still. It's st they're still doing banking the same way we did in 1930, 1910. It's still the same mindset. So I think if someone could come in and really change the culture of a bank and let the employees use their imagination a little bit more and how you're going to serve the customers. I don't think we need someone to come in and say, we're doing away with X, doing away with Y, and completely changing the way we bank. But if there's a CEO out there that can empower their employees to really change the way they interact with customers, that'd be cool. Morgan? Look, when uh, the things I like about Elon Musk and people like Jeff Bezos as well is that they have a relentless focus on their customers. And that's really what they, 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 all they ask all day is what can we do better for our customers? But look, when you talk about Elon Musk and does banking need someone like him? This is a guy who is envisioning building a high-speed train that goes 800 miles an hour. This is a guy who built a rocket ship company. This is the last thing that Wall Street needs. I think banking should be boring. The, the, the most profitable long-term banks are usually boring banks. And the history of banks getting into deep innovation, let alone things like rocket ships and hyperloops, uh, <laughs> tends to end disaster. So that was Paul Volcker's famous quote that the only useful innovation in banking in the last 30 years has been the ATM machine. Uh, now, we have mobile, now we have mobile banking, so even the ATM machine is not that useful anymore. Uh, but so I, I'm going to say no, banking does not need an Elon Musk. David think? Wright, Morgan Wrong, <laughs> banking does need an Elon Musk. I think, uh, but I think you hit it on the head that, that, that uh, Elon Musk and Tesla 
relentlessly focused on the customer and relentlessly focused on product. I mean, in this tweet, uh, the best safety rating for the Model S of any car ever tested by the U.S. government, just this focus on creating such a great product. And, and, and I think that banking could use somebody like that. There are some banks out there that are sort of pushing the envelope right now. Bank of Bank of the Internet, B of I Holding, that's a, that's a foolish favorite right now. They're doing some interesting things in terms of being all online, trying to offer some better, uh, some better products, some better interest rates to customers. Uh, over at Huntingdon Bank Shares, too, I think they're doing some really interesting things. They have a, a quote on their website that says, treating people right doesn't have to cost a thing. Uh, Huntington has what they call asterisk free, tr asterisk free checking, which is basically free checking with no ifs, ands, or buts. They also have a 24-hour grace period on overdrafts. So they're really thinking in terms of the customer, how do you serve the customer, make them happy? I, I think we can have more people in the banking sphere thinking like this. How can we make customers really, really happy? Happy. I agree, but if Goldman Sachs ever builds anything that goes 800 miles an hour, I'm going to run for my life. I'm buying. I'm, <laughs> I'm buying the Goldman Sachs Hyperloop. Well, thanks for watching, folks. For Morgan Housel and David Hansen, I'm Matt Kopenheffer. Thanks for watching.